goody goody, here it comes. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. <laughs> oh my God, don't stop now. With your hosts, Brian, John, and Elaine. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Coddington. Join my fellow co-hosts and filmmakers, John and Lane Woolscroft. And the Oscar goes to... D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, a classic. I didn't know I was nominated. <laughs> you went with a classic, and I like it. D's nuts. Oh, Childish nice. right off the bat. Somebody just turned this off. It was the first episode they ever listened to. <laughs> nope. Like, wow, that nope. guy's an asshole. <laughs> nope. So uh, we're on episode 90. We're on uh, three? 93? <laughs> sure. That was a good year. 93. Jurassic yeah. Park, Schindler's List. I thought it was 92. I could be wrong. No, I think we're on 93. Cool. I'm pretty sure Nailed we're on 93. Nailed it. Elaine, as you're like flipping through your phone, I thought we were on 92. I'm <laughs> looking through my notes for our news bit, Jackalodeon, <gasps> but thanks. That, yep, 93. That is potty mouth. <laughs> so yeah, this uh, week we're going to be talking about the Oscars and reviewing uh, the whether we were right or wrong with some of our own personal picks, because we didn't do a... Uh, rundown of our own picks we did one for the razzies but not for the oscars right yeah we'll be kind of breaking down um you know the nominees talking about the films that were mm-hmm. nominated uh seeing what they got right what they got wrong etc always et a good time. uh but before we get to all that we've got a mixed bag of news bits this time yeah we do i think that's fun when we do like a mixed bag mm-hmm. it's like mixed nuts and then we'll just reach deep into that sack you know. <laughs> see what we pull out. Well, do you guys want me to go first, or who are we going first? Do you want to, uh, who wants yeah, to talk? Who Lane, wants, you go first. Who wants the spirit stick? <laughs> you go first, Lane. First. All right, cool. So um, some awesome financial news, um, you know, in the face of uh, diversity, that was like a big theme at the Oscars, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, something really cool going on in the box office right now. Um, so uh, Black Panther has made so, so much money. Stupid money. Like stupid money. They are almost to five hundred and sixty two million domestic. Wow. And they've crossed the billion dollar mark worldwide, which is so great. Like wow. it's made just amazing money, which is no, good that's... because it's a great movie. You know what I mean? Like I like it when that's rewarded. So that's billion with a B. Billion right, with yeah. a B. <laughs> Indeed. It has not yet reached zillions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, well, for, sold in that and yeah. this is what the Burbanium. fourth. I think this is its fourth weekend. Yeah, and it's it'll still gross around forty two million for the weekend for just this weekend. Mm-hmm. I mean, so Worldwide? it's steadily still uh, no domestic, okay, and it's still earning like crazy. So um, then, uh, Wrinkle in Time then is the other movie. Um, you know, obviously Ryan Coogler, um, uh, African American director. And then we have um, Ava DuVernay, who did A Wrinkle in Time, who is um, also a woman and African-American, and she's uh, done A Wrinkle in Time. That is at $33.3 million. Wow. Um, I mean, for, for kids' movie, in theory. I mean, you know, because this is based on the books by Madeline Lingle, but... Is that the number one movie at the box office this weekend, Wrinkle in Time? Uh, no, it's. I, I don't believe it is. I think is Black, Black Panther. I think Black Panther strong. is still, yeah, okay. still is still number strong. one. Mm-hmm. But uh, second in place, you know, obviously, um, had, did a nice tidy thirty three million this weekend, um, which was its uh, second weekend, I believe, um, for um, box office and whatnot. So, like I said, these are based on the books by Madeline Lingle, so they would be more geared toward a child family yeah. kind of audience. So I think those are respectable numbers, and um, you know, so. Cool. A lot of money. <laughs> money, 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 money. And well, and what's nice is just seeing like the diversity and like if anyone ever wants to say that it doesn't pay off anymore, like they're oh, wrong. Yeah. Like yeah. it does. They movies by minorities make money. Wait, wait till the Black Widow movie comes out. Like seriously, if ever. Oh, it will. They've they've already said they're going to be making a Black Widow. Movie. They've been saying that for like no, six but years. like after Wonder Woman, they said. We're gonna make it. ching That's what they said. That's why. But what I'm what I'm saying is, wait till the Black Widow movie comes out. I mean, I mean, not ka-ching. Uh, it's because it's the right thing to do. Uh, hashtag times up. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> it's true. It's kind of true. But John, you got also a little bit of a news bit going on, guys. Who's your favorite Bond? Oh, good question. Uh, Pierce um, Brosnan. I would say oh, that's tough. Mm. I think I'm. It's a, it's a it's a toss up between Sean Connery and 
Roger Moore. Wrong, Peter Sellers. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know who nobody said? Uh, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, nobody. Nobody likes said Timothy that. Dalton. Well, speaking of Timothy Dalton, he uh, almost did not get the role of James Bond, as apparently Sam Neill auditioned for what? The Living Daylights in 1986. Wow, and he looks horrifying with jet black dyed hair. Where Where did you find this? Uh, I was just. Circle in the, uh, the internet drain for uh, some film news. <laughs> Discovered this. And so he's, he's so was, was this not previously known? Like, no one knew about this beforehand? I think it was, like, not a secret. But, you know, it's one of those things that you probably, probably tons of people audition for things all the time. Yeah. And it never goes anywhere. And it's, but, yeah, he looked really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it was a nightmare. Um, just an odd screen test. And... Uh, you know, he had pointed out that Connery, and to this day, has about, been about the only one that's been able to sustain a film career post being James Bond. Right. You know, Pierce Brosnan. Like, although by the time Living Daylights came out, it he you kind of got the sense that Pierce Brosnan was no longer into the workout well, living, regimen. Living Daylights was you know, uh, except bringing fish fillets to well, his mouth. Well, Living Daylights was wow. Timothy Dalton. Right. Yeah. Or did I say you said Pierce Brosnan? Yeah, I said for Die Another Day. You said for Living Daylight. Ah, well, die, well, the last, yeah, the last Pierce Brosnan. But yeah, movie, by the time we got day. to yeah. Die Another Day, that's that's yeah. when it was just like he's he, he just looks like he was it constantly in. swollen by a bee. You well, know? now um, you see him, and God, he has like that like silver hair. Like he's in that he's in that show. I'm doing that old people thing where I'm like he's in that show about remember the that thing. Show like I have no about fucking stuff? idea. <laughs> remember we watched it when I should... we were at where was it that restaurant <laughs> <laughs> anyway he has like a show where they've let him just go into his old man glory and he's like oh, yeah. all like it's not silver fox like they've taken the fox out of it it's sad <laughs> it's bad but yeah he you know it's funny he says like he was grateful to not get it because he was terrified of just having that commitment and if he had done it he pr- might not have gotten Jurassic Park that's true and yeah. I mean that's a huge role for him and that's... not I mean, there was a drop off of the Bond movies. You know, there was two Dalton movies and then a big pause. And then 95 is when Goldeneye came out with Pierce Brosnan. I think it was 94. Um, I think 95. I think it was 94. 95. You guys always do this. <laughs> uh, Brian's looking it up as we speak. Uh, <laughs> yes, his, his face. I wish but, you guys could see. Um, so inconspicuous. But he could have technically done Jurassic Park, but they purposely cast Sam Neill because they didn't want, like. God uh, damn it, it was 95. Aha. Right? Because <laughs> uh, they didn't want, you know, big name. Because the rumor going around was that they were going to get Harrison Ford for Jurassic Park. Oh, but really? They didn't want that because they obviously the movie, the star of the movie was the dinosaurs. Yeah. So, you know, you cast something like Sam Neill, who people are probably aware of, was like, because he was in that movie where he tried to rape Nicole Kim on a boat for two hours. Oh, my God, that fucking movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so he's known. But, too, he's also um, a good actor. Which he's also I think in that Invisible Man movie, too. With Chevy Chase. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh God! Yeah. yeah, Chevy's done some stinkers. Hasn't He's he? done some stinkers. Um, but you know, so he might not have been in Jurassic Park, and that would have been a disservice to all of us. Um, but moving on here, I thought this was hilarious. Jesse Heisenberg says he's open to playing Lex Luthor again. Oh, I bet he is. I'm sure the money was fine. Be still, my heart, <laughs> my beating yes, heart. Yes, because you know that was the one thing I was so concerned about. Is Jesse Eisenberg gonna be the fucking Lex Luthor again? Well, here's what's weird about it. That's what I was worried about. He doesn't know if he'll be in an. How many of these do they have planned, and they don't even know if they're using Lex Luthor? How fuck? You're not even gonna have fucking Ben Affleck as Batman the next time around. They're just like, oh well, we know Eisenberg's got nothing else going on. Well, they're gonna have multiple Batmans and multiple Jokers, and Jesse Eisenberg doesn't even know if he's playing Lex Luthor, and they're already in production on Man of Steel too, like pre-production. <laughs> what a fucking mess. <laughs> Great job, DC. Yeah, yeah <laughs> really, you, just shit the bed. You had something good going with Dark, the whole Dark Knight trilogy, and you managed to just fuck it up over the course of less than ten years. It's crazy. I'm just assuming that every scene that Jesse Eisenberg was in Batman v Superman, it was like the second unit director, and <laughs> he's like, Wait, "Is that how? Is that how Zach wants him to act?" I don't know. Just keep rolling. You know? like, <laughs> <laughs> no direction, yeah. no knowledge. Yeah, it just had no idea what was going on. So I. First off, they're not going to invite you back because you suck. Secondly, I can't believe that you don't even know that yet, considering they're planning like 30 of these in advance. But that's uh, that's what you got. Yeah. What I got is uh, another dip from the uh, world of Star Wars. Nah. You know, we were joking what's before. Star Wars? Uh, you what's know, a, what's I've a heard, Star Wars? I see that T-shirt you I've wear. John, Brian is... literally has a Star Wars shirt on. <laughs> 
I've I've heard that it's some kind of space opera. Oh, like uh, with like Spock and Kirk? No, no, not oh. like with Spock and Kirk. This is, is it with, for babies, though? It is not for babies. Technically, oh, it is. actually for okay. adults. <laughs> but what happens is it's about people with these things called laser swords or light, light daggers. I mean, are they what? Are they phallic? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. But anyway, so uh, news coming from Star Wars. Apparently, John Favreau. Of Iron Man and uh, Cowboys and Aliens fame. Oh my God, I forgot. I, ha- I had to bring that up. I forgot. Is, Don't forget uh, Elf. Oh, and Don't Elf fame. Forget. Um, is going to be directing a new live action series surrounding Star Wars. In case, like you know, one Star Wars movie a year wasn't good enough for you, and you and you were like, "How long will it take me to get sick of this shit?" <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, they're they're giving it the full Marvel treatment. Like this, this is quite literally the full Marvel treatment, which makes sense because it's coming from Disney. How long so, before there's a Star Wars TV channel? That's oh well, that's well, kind that's, of what this is. Tell them more, Brian. Okay, so oh, God. so this is being made specifically for Disney's new streaming service that's going to be rivaling Netflix and mm. and Amazon. No, no. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you know how in I think it's in a year or two they're actually going to be removing every piece of Disney property from Netflix. Of course everything. They are. Yeah. So everything that's Marvel, anything that's Star Wars, anything that is traditional Disney stuff is getting pulled away. Is every studio going to follow suit? Is there going to be like a Universal Studio streaming service? Probably. And, I mean, that's that's, that's that what they're trying to do. Things go. Um, you know? But uh, let's see how long that lasts. By the way. Um, because, you know, it took so long for us to get away from just pirating movies and actually start paying for it again. So it's like now they're going to milk the cow cow and be like, oh, well, let's just throw another streaming service out there. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, I don't have much faith in this. <laughs> I don't have faith in anything with Star Wars. I, I know you anymore. don't. I know you're, you're you're a dead shell of a person when it comes to Star Wars. <laughs> you, but... you cannot tell me you're excited about Han Solo, the movie. <laughs> That I'm not excited oh, for that. God. The night. resoloing. So the resoloing. <laughs> no, I just with this, I'm just like, why John Favreau? Like, you saw what he did with Iron Man two. You saw Cowboys and Aliens, and you want to do this? Like, I, I mean, I guess he's good. I mean, he did the Jungle Book, but <sighs> all I can think of is like his partnership with Vince Vaughn, which automatically makes him a piece of crap to me. Oh, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but I got I got to say, I mean, some of the movies he's been in, like he's acted in, are good. Like, he was in Chef. He was good in that. I mean, he yeah. was also uh, really good in um, what the hell movie was it? Very Bad Things. Oh yeah, which we'll eventually talk. Which about. we were a bunch of really that about. awful. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, that's really my news. Uh, uh, so got a little bit guys, from everywhere. A little bit of everything. Maybe it'll be good. You think about that. <laughs> well, I mean, if they follow the formula of Rebels and Clone War, I mean, we've talked about this before. Like, that, I mean, that would be great. You know, like those are high quality properties, you know, but live action worries me. It could get very silly. Here's the thing. They could either go Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with it, which um, a lot of people like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. mainly after they kind of found their voice and started doing their own stories and not trying to worry about making sure that you interlock with the movies. Um, or they could make it more about the movies. If they go more about the movies and less about the individual characters they're creating, then there's going to be trouble. Um, I worry because, especially with Star Wars, it seems to be almost more so than Marvel properties, where they care more that everything kind of locks together. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. Well, that's our news bit. Uh, We're going to take a little bit of a break and throw it to our friends over the Epicast Network. When we come back, we'll be talking Oscars. Hey, yo, 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 I'm Ed Bailey. I'm here with Dave Bracey. And we are the Drinking Partners Podcast on Epicast Network. Fucked it up. Make sure you check us out, man. We got the Comedy Fuel, which is really supposed to be Beer Fuel Comedy Podcast, but. Craft, yeah, Craft Fuel Beer Potter. Craft Fuel. Craft Beer Fuel Pot. Motherfucker, right. man. I'm gonna have to write that down. What up, craft what up? Fuel. Craft Fuel Hold Beer on, Podcast. Yeah, cra- Craft Fuel. The craft craft brew fuel fill pot. Oh, craft, craft, craft beer fuel podcast. podcast. Okay. Craft brew fuel. Craft beer fuel comedy. Those are not four words that you say normally. All right. Craft brew you 
knew that I was gonna fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you knew. Craft Beer Fuel Comedy Podcast. Alright, so Craft Beer Fuel Comedy Podcast on. You can find us on EpicastNetwork.com slash PartnersPod. You can find us at PartnersPod on Facebook, Twitter, and IG. And you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Lipson under Drinking Partners. Yo, if you ain't heard and if you don't know, Drinking Partners is the crew, Epicast is the family. Make sure you check us out, man. And we're back. That was a message from our friends over the Epicast Network, specifically the Drinking Partners mm-hmm. podcast. <laughs> oh, God, are we back? Oh, yeah. Well, you said we were taking a break, so I took a nap. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like, Where you, are didn't we? Even, you didn't even let me finish. So, <laughs> anyway, check them out at epicastnetwork.com. Where, what else can they check out at epicastnetwork.com? I don't know. Marta, Cinema Psycho Show, uh, Pittsburgh uh, Local News, Cinema with Sam Leonard. Show. Yeah, Cinema Psycho Show. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, so the Oscars happened. Yeah. The- Yay. <laughs> Brian, you seem John- thrilled. <laughs> I thought you were all about the Oscars. I am not. <laughs> oh. I clearly have you not been paying nice attention though? for two you know, and a half You years. know what was nice, though? They made sure they had the right envelopes this time around. <laughs> yeah, because, well, at the end of the show, they wheeled out, you know, the senior citizens group of Warren Beatty. Um, and, of course, her name is Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. Thank you. Um, yeah, Bonnie and Clyde came out and didn't ruin it this time. Well, I thought, you know, for something that happens on that big of a stage, you know, it's live television, you know, I, um, now obviously it wasn't me that was told I won and then it was taken away and then I wasn't one, the person that did win and wasn't credited right away. So, I mean, it isn't necessarily my place to have any feelings about it, but like, I didn't think it was as big of a deal as everyone kind of made it out to be. I thought it was funny. It was, though it was amazing television in the moment. You know, we talked about it last year, how like, I was like, okay, well that's that. And I just went to the bathroom and then all of a sudden John starts screaming like, oh my God, they called the wrong movie. (laughs) You know? So, I mean, like it was interesting certainly, but I think as much as you can handle something like this and kind of like make mention of it without making too big of a deal. Like I thought they handled it pretty well. You know, I thought it was funny that they brought them back out, you know, this year to, you know, for a redemption and, you know, well, and they redemption. actually did redeem themselves on like John Travolta who, you know, said Adele Dazeem one year and then they brought him out with Adina Menzel. And then he just like raped her face for and like 20 minutes. Oh, he kept he like kinda, grabbing her cheeks. He kind and of ears. like mauled her. Yeah. That and, was awkward. Like, combing her hair. Poor Adina. Like a, like a drunken, like monkey in the zoo. Like, <laughs> Just petting it, drunken monkey. Yeah. <laughs> the perv yeah. never bothered her anyway. <laughs> she she was like stone faced, like good for her. She nailed it. I think the only thing that turns him on anymore is um. Oh jet come on, airliners. just don't even, oh. don't even. Let's it's not. a jet airliners. Okay, all yeah. right. So I, mean, I don't trust you. <laughs> so there weren't really any faux pas this this time around, right? It was pretty much a tight ship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, if I may, I say was... because I didn't watch it. <laughs> If if I may, it was a little boring, honestly. Like it, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of like dazzle or like humor, and like some moments. I mean, some moments were kind of okay and have been memeified. But um, the Jennifer Gardner thing is the big meme. Yeah, and like I don't know why uh, she made like a face. She made a face. Who cares? I don't know. Um, She's always making a face. Tiffany Haddish and and Maya Rudolph. Everyone's clamoring for them to host next year. Yeah. Because they were funny and stuff. And I don't know. I mean, like, they were right. Tiffany okay. Haddish is good in small doses. She's like Malcolm in Jurassic Park. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> and then they made him the star of the second movie. And, and it's like, like, no. Oh, oh no. So, I do <laughs> Too love, much glow bloom. <laughs> I do Too much bloom. that Tiffany wears that white Alexander McQueen for everything she does. And, like, okay. she's done, a, like, a comedy bit about it. She did it in her monologue for us on L when she hosted. Mm-hmm. And she wears the same dress for, like, every fancy event because it was so expensive. She wants to get her money's worth out of it. And when she came out in that dress, I was like, Fuck, she's not playing around. She's really wearing it for everything. It was awesome. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that while this was one of the lowest rated Oscars they've had in quite a long time, is that the host has to be as universally known, not even liked, but known mm-hmm. as possible. And most people, you know, Darn, Tiffany, Tiffany Hoodish. And, and my my Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. Who are these people, Al? I don't know. I would be curious what their main demographic is at this point, though, because I I don't know who is watching the Oscars. I'd be really curious on some numbers. If on I had that. to take a guess, I would say people who watch Jimmy Kimmel. Maybe I, do, I but... don't think so. I don't. You don't think, think the, so. I I think the host, like I said, needs to be well known mm-hmm. enough. Yeah, but also kind of 
milk toast. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from Jimmy. When no, you say like that. I mean, not polarizing. You yeah, know? like or you unknown either. Mm-hmm. Like I'm surprised that they've ever had Chris Rock host because you know Chris can get kind of intense. Like mm-hmm. Jimmy Kimmel, Ellen DeGeneres, these guys really kind of Billy toe Crystal. The line. So, yeah, Billy Crystal somewhere right in the middle. Like, nobody hates Billy Crystal. A lot of people don't love Billy Crystal, but nobody just like oh, I'm not watching guy. it because of Billy. You know, right. <laughs> it's just not funny. It's right. I mean, it's why Anymore, Jim Carrey's yeah. never yeah. hosted the Oscars. Right. Like you couldn't get somebody that rubs people the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're not going to get like Andrew Dice Clay hosting the Oscars. <laughs> well, I mean, you need people like more famous than that. Hey, that bitch. I, I fuck think... the fish. Hey. <laughs> oh, my God. The Dice Man. I oh think I think they should have Tommy Wiseau do it. I would. Oh, oh, that would just be amazing. The Bizarro Oscars. It's all just his Everett, opening monologue. Every the, every the winner of the best Oscar for 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 my movie is me. <laughs> <laughs> I got. Hey, he was at the Globes. I don't know, guys. He was at the Globes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, because Mr. Wiseau's uh, opening monologue ran three hours, we're just going to start running off the names of the winners real quick. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> we're going to lo- get cut off the yeah. air. Um, yeah, no, so the show went pretty well. Um, I do have an updated, as I said, um, top five films of the year now that I've actually got to see the nominees. Mm-hmm. Right. And I did get to see all nine. Um, wow. As always, you're very committed to your yeah. craft. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I feel like a walking advertisement, but like that movie pass thing we have is a fucking game yeah, changer. Yeah, because you saw them all in theaters. Right? Yeah. Yep. He, he, you've seen one. what, like 16 movies this year so far? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. It's crazy. Uh, but the updated list is uh, number five, Lady Bird. Number four, Logan, still on the list. Um, I went back and forth on Get Out and The Shape of Water, but I'm going to go Get Out 3, Shape of Water 2, and Detroit is still number one. If you haven't seen that movie, go out of your way to see it. I don't know how it got ignored for everything. It did. But it's still, to me, the best movie of the year. It just, it came and it went, and no one remembers it. Go see Detroit. Very cool. Very cool, John. But uh, I have I have ideas why it might have got ignored. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there were other movies that were controversial for lack of a better term that didn't get ignored but yeah um yeah just to, let's um let's kind of run down the the nominees for best mm-hmm. picture because it was kind of all over the map and mm-hmm. it was it was an odd year and i'd like to start um on the bad end of things the only movie that i out and out hated was phantom thread oh my god that movie was so bad <laughs> and i mean oh i am i'm a big big paul thomas anderson advocate like i think he's of his generation probably one of you know the best filmmakers out there or out there, period. Uh, and this movie, wow. It was bad. Oh, God. If I hadn't like, if I hadn't felt the need to see it for the show and that I was already in the theater, yeah. I would have just left. Like, If I, I'd rented it, I would have turned it off. I checked my phone every 10 minutes. I asked John what time it was a couple of times. Like, We went to the theater to see it, and I just felt like I was being held captive. Like, I, because, you know, when you go to a movie with somebody else, you also can't leave. You know what I mean? So, because I didn't know how John was feeling about it. And even if he didn't like it, I don't think he would have wanted to leave anyway. And I was right. He didn't like it, but we didn't leave. But I mean, what a misogynistic piece of fucking garbage. Like, just about horrible people that don't act. Eccentric weirdos. Yeah. That didn't act the way I thought real people would act. Um, the only good thing about this movie was what it won for was the costuming. The The clothes were spectacular. It was about a clothing maker, you know, about a designer in a time when, like, you know, the word chic was just starting to come out. So um, it was in uh, 50s England, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so the historical context was there. And <laughs> it's I mean, the kind of thing that you think 50s English people would be like. <laughs> yeah. And like, but the, I mean, the dresses were stunning. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. that part of it was amazing. But I mean, the movie sucked balls. And Daniel Day Lewis wants this to be his final film. I mean, well, the right? thing is, the only thing that is redeeming is that he was fantastic in he it. He was quite good. I mean, his character was insufferable. Yeah. But he was, as always, fantastic. He, he was, he was very good. Um, the, I would say the acting all around was very good because the woman who played his sister. sister and that was up for the supporting actress and yeah. she quite deserved that. I thought she was very good too. It just was one of those movies that makes you want to tear your hair out because you hate every character so there's no foothold in it for me emotionally oh. for me to give a damn about any of these people. That That's what always gets me every time is when I can't just relate or, or even like sympathize. Like right. I don't have to love every character and I find myself oftentimes even liking flawed characters but there was nothing. Those movies sucked. Well, speaking of emotionally disconnected from reality, but this time the filmmaker Dunkirk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just we have to give up on Nolan at okay. this point now, oh, right? Like shit. we're just done with Nolan. Well, no, right? I mean, if you if you like a mathematically precise movie, 
then he's your filmmaker. You know, it's like he's like Watson. If Watson is like Watson started <laughs> directing you mean, movies, you mean the the, uh, the, the chess ma- the machine? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> was like I, Jeopardy. I was like going to a Holmes. Oh no, not, not, not Holmes. 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 Yeah. I was like, no, what? No, he's talking about the giant robot that that masters chess. Yeah, yeah and Jeopardy. <laughs> Jeopardy. Yeah. So yeah, that's what Christopher Nolan is like as a filmmaker to me. Dunkirk is as as expected. It's beautiful. It's interestingly paced. Um, you know, the cinematography is wonderful, but there's no character you remember. There's no emotional foothold in anything. And it's as always with his movies too long. Mm. So, you know, the only time that I didn't check my watch on a Christopher Nolan movie, I think was the dark Knight. Yeah. Um, interstellar. I liked that movie. Really? I didn't have a problem with interstellar. I, I, I wasn't crazy about that. I mean, it, I would say that it is like, I haven't seen Dunkirk. So, I mean, I felt it was kind of his most, uh, one of the longest films he's ever done and it, it definitely dragged on a lot and you're just like can we get through this shit Whoa. okay why are we in the the bizarro dimension and all that stuff i mean it was, it was just you know it was long but i liked it i liked the concept of it well what's interesting that um i thought there was something that was really telling that john had said when we were just like talking about it in private is so darkest hour and dunkirk are essentially about the exact same time period yeah. and john said that the the Dunkirk was more about the actions that were taking place, but the darkest hour was infinitely more interesting, even though it was just about people who were talking about it and who weren't at the like front lines of the action. And I think that was a really interesting way to kind of put it in perspective. Sounds like it was more of a, a personal story. Like mm-hmm. the darkest hour was mostly about the, the individuals there. It yeah. was not uh, action driven as you mm-hmm. know, Dunkirk is. It's strange. We had two movies that were, both about Dunkirk in the same year. I mean, it was it's probably one of the most famous World War II battles, but still odd that there was two films and they both get nominated about the same thing. That happens a lot, though. It Studios does. will come out about the same thing and often like race to distribute the film first. You like, know, you you remember when they had the big rush to do the uh, turn of the century illusionist movies? Yeah, man. Yeah, Prestige, but those prestige bitches. But these movies are different enough that I don't think they were like, oh, we got one meteor movie, we, we want to compete with that other studio's meteor movie. Like, I think that they just happen to be about the same things by happenstance. No, I don't think there's happenstance in this stuff. They actually no, they <laughs> the actually studio system. Well, I, I just I the way I see it is they they calculate out when they can release it and they know like I don't I don't believe with the illusionist and with prestige that they came out at the exact same time um but they came out in the same year. Yeah, just at different times of the year. Like uh, Deep Impact and uh, Armageddon. <laughs> I yep. liked Deep Impact. Yep. That was my favorite I, of those. I like The Illusionist. Like, a lot of people don't like The Illusionist. I oh, think it's I didn't great. mind it, but I like The Prestige better. I oh, well, yeah. I mean, it's a better movie. But... Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. Um, Chris, go back to making movies like that. Okay, <laughs> just go back to making those movies. <laughs> uh, Dark Darkest Hour, just briefly touching that, because uh, we've mentioned it now. It's that's it's a one-trick pony movie. Like Although it is beautifully shot, it's all about um, the performance from... Um, I want to say Lee Harvey Oswald. Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman, thank you. <laughs> Dra- it was from Dracula. He did great. Dracula uh, and, you know, Tiptoes. You mean domestic abuse? <laughs> do Tiptoes. Do you mean domestic abuser Gary Oldman? Yes. Hey, now that he's gotten his award, now they can punish him. You know, yeah. well, I just think it's so convenient that we all forgot until he wins this award and continues to be rewarded. Again, you know, like um, Kobe Bryant also was awarded at the Oscars, yeah. ironically. Unknown rapist won Best Oscar. I mean, you know, we talk about this and how, you know, Time's Up and Me Too are co-opted for the wrong reasons, and this is a great example of that. There's not, we're just not quite there yet, you know. Um, but then the movie that should have been called Nominate Me for an Award, The Post, Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you liked it, though. You said it was yeah, good, oh, yeah. right? It, it was very good. It was not for everybody. It was it was slow. And if you don't like movies based on, like, journalism, like, you know, people sitting around and arguing about the ethics of news reporting. You mean, yeah. like, Spotlight? Or, you know, yeah, um, the movie with Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, all, w- the pa- all the President's Woodward. Men. Yep, yep. Like, yeah, if you're not into that type of movie, you will be bored of tears with this movie. <laughs> I, lo- I happen to love those kind of movies. Basically, um, if you're into Aaron Zorkin stuff. Yeah. Talking. Like, yeah, that's so it. So much talking. Yeah, yeah th- this is what they call one of those talkies. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is one of the uh, movies, a lot of movies were about, you know, women and their struggle to get some kind of footholding in a movie or in a world 
just dominated by, mm-hmm. you know, mansplaining. In this movie, the uh, head of the Post, uh, Washington Post, basically made a decision with all these men breathing down her neck saying, you can't publish, you can't publish, you can't publish. And she said, fuck it. I'm going to do it. And that was Meryl Streep's character in right. the film, based on obviously real people. And they published the story. And that was what basically saved the Washington Post. And the Washington Post was the news outlet that a couple of years later broke the Watergate story. Nice. Oh, so this happened before Watergate? Yep. Wow. And if they yeah. hadn't been around, Nixon may have gotten away with Watergate. So, That's crazy. Uh, so she made, she made the bold choice of... Um, to not listen to all these men telling her what she should do. Right. And, you know, so. I'm a big fan. <laughs> speaking of speaking of the, the ladies, we got Lady Bird, which is very much a character piece. I enjoyed this quite a bit. Yeah, Obviously, I did too. I just, it was, was my fifth favorite of the year. So. It was quiet. Yeah, I mean, um, but it's interesting because John and I recently from the from a Red Box date, we just went to the Red Box and got a movie. Um, we saw a lot of similarities with um, The Edge of Seventeen, uh, which has mm-hmm. Haley Steinfeld in it, and um, obviously this, you know, Lady Bird was made as a movie more poised for the Oscars, you know, more. Um, in that like indie kind yeah. of vibe, you know, obviously, um, Edge of Seventeen was a little quirkier, a little darker, I thought, like a little, especially in the humor aspect. Um, but it was an interesting kind of parallel to to see that like you know female American coming of age, and you know when you're in your last couple years of high school yeah. and you're figuring shit out, and you know and a Juno vibe to it. Yeah, a little bit, well, a little bit. No um, without it, being it that desperate, right? <laughs> and it wasn't, yeah, like it didn't have that whole like. I'm going to say like funny things and that's my entire personality, but I otherwise have no layers kind of like Diablo Cody vibe. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, well, I thought the edge of 17 was a better movie, uh, interestingly, but yeah. I liked them both quite a bit. Yeah, I did too. I, I liked Lady Bird. It, it was almost like too much. Cause it was like the exact year I graduated high school. So oh. like I really identified with it and it, it was like, you know, like high school still, like when you're that age, like a lot of things happen to you, like that hit your tender parts mm-hmm. and how much you shape of who you are, like in that time. Like it's crazy to think of like how you're different, but like how you're also still the same. Right. Yeah. Um, and moving on to probably the contro- most controversial one here, the three billboards outside Evan. I Missouri. saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I liked yeah. it. That I thought a, it was a, that was a heavy movie. A very well, deep movie. A yeah. lot of people were upset over, um, you know, Sam Rockwell's quote unquote redemption in this movie. I could see that. And yeah, considering that. that he was a racist buffoon the whole movie, for him to just out of nowhere. And he did get like this... almost kill a man. Yeah. Yeah. He like, throws somebody he out. He threw of a window. man out a window. <laughs> for allowing somebody to, you know, use a billboard. Yes. Because they paid for it. <laughs> um Heaven <yeah>. forbid. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate uh, commerce. Throw you out a window. <laughs> yeah. A lot of this movie I felt was comical. Like uh yeah. Sam Rockwell's entire performance was kind of laughable. At, at points. Mm, uh, interesting. And uh, th- when she's throwing Mob Top cocktails in the police station, like the only thing I thought that was missing, considering also because Sam Rockwell was in the police station, not hearing it was a laugh track. <laughs> it just, I, I just was like, yeah. And I thought, oh, this is the end of the movie, right? Because she's throwing these Mob Tops and it went for like another 40 minutes. Yeah. The ending was bizarre and kind of yeah. open ended. I thought this movie would just would have been better if Francis McDormand's character had been black. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I thought, you know, considering we that it does take place in the south. Yeah. You know. And with all the racial undertones of this movie, you know, and you could have you it would have been easier to say, "Oh, maybe, you know, Woody Harrelson, who does seem like a pretty good cop in the movie, is ignoring the case because oh, it's just another, you know, dead raped black girl." Mm-hmm. And that opens up a whole another set of conversations. And then it would have been easier to have a conversation of her going with Sam Rockwell at the right. end of the movie um, because it would have been, you know, a choice made by somebody who is, you know, already, you know, somebody that has been kind of uh, marginalized by right. the white ruling class. But I don't know. I just thought that would have been an interesting. More I, an interesting I think dynamic. it would have made it uh, less of a comedy because that's yeah. the thing is, is three billboards. My wife and I watched it and we were just like, why does this feel like a comedy? It's a dark comedy, but there are times where it's comedic, and I don't think they meant for it. Yeah, to be. like there, like a lot of uh, Francis McDermott's dialogue is funny. Like it, it is it is has that dark humor to it. Yeah. So like there were times I'm laughing at it, and I'm just like, this is still supposed to be heavy stuff. Mm. And it, you know, I think some of that comedy, well, you know, for an audience, it's it's good because it does give you a little bit of a break, but it takes away from 
some of the deep stuff they're trying to talk about. Yeah. So. And then it was the what I would call the two way race. Although a lot of people thought for a long time three billboards had it in the bag, but it mm-hmm. was I the, I had it early as an early pick. Yeah. The two the two way fight was uh, really get out in the shape of water, which is interesting because they are very big genre films. Oh yeah. In uh, an, uh, in the academy does not like genre films. Mm-mm. Period. But um. they are both films about marginalized people yes mm-hmm. and um i should throw this into the uh the steel bucket bob chipman of um uh in bob we trust on youtube um mm. he brought up a very good point i'm going to steal his point here was that the reason shape of water won over get out is that the shape of water was about the type of people that smug liberals like to say oh yeah we help them and and we put our money to that and and you know we're we're part of the helping the cause and get out was really focusing the attention on them mm-hmm. and when you got a bunch of old elitist liberal white men it's like oh i don't like get out as much because i look like the villain in that one where shape of water i look like the hero interesting john that's interesting a very interesting point i mean i i agree i personally think get out should have won I think it's a better film. Here's the only thing that really separated the two from me, and and this is going to sound shallow, but when the story's great, the acting's great, the pacing's great, the only thing that really separated the two was that Shape of Water, to me, was more beautiful. Yeah, Prettier. I mean... The cinematography, yeah. the art direction, everything was just exquisite. Well, it's just funny, too, because it takes place in the 40s? 50s. 50s. The 50s, that's... Yep. That's an easier time to romanticize visually, though. You know, you have beautiful costuming because, I mean, there was a good chance that that was going to win, like, costume as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you have beautiful set design. You know, Get Out was shot here and now and, you know, didn't have maybe as many opportunities to to look as beautiful just by virtue of it being a modern story. I I just thought, I mean, like, I, I saw both films and I just felt that Get Out had the better story. You know what I mean? Like I just felt like it was it was a story that was unique because of the fact that it paints people that you know I, I mean we're we're all three three white people in here that yeah. are somewhat progressive and it paints us as the negative, right? You know, but I think that's refreshing. Well, so does really um, Shape of Water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, not to turn this into a social justice warrior time, but you know these movies. A lot of people probably growing up viewed themselves as the monsters because they were gay, they were handicapped, they were transgender, they mm-hmm. were any number of things, even just being female in, in, in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. And they probably thought, I kind of, you know, relate to the monster and mm-hmm. not this big strapping white broad shoulder guy who's like, don't worry, I'll kill it. Even though it just looks fearful, I'm going to destroy it. And so for the longest time, the white guy was the hero of these stories and Mm -hmm. the monster was destroyed and the woman was just fainting and there to be saved. And this movie said, what if the monster wasn't really a monster? What if we just misunderstood him and treated him like garbage because he was different? Mm -hmm. And then we have a woman who can't speak and we have a gay man and we have a black woman Mm -hmm. and we have all these people that are they're the real heroes. The African American characters, the female characters, mm-hmm. the gay characters, and and somebody that is viewed as a monster. It was a nice change, you know. And, and the person that normally, in the, if this movie had come out in the fifties, Michael Shannon character would have been the hero. Was the, the despicable monster? Yeah, mm-hmm. he was really the monster of the film, you know. Yeah. Although Michael Shannon was a hint over the top, as he always is. He's always a little over the top. <laughs> I don't know. Have you seen Waco, like the actual TV show Waco? No. He's in that. He actually plays yeah. the hero in that. Um, huh. There really isn't a hero in Waco, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he plays one of the FBI negotiators, and he's actually really subdued, and actually does one of his best performances in that show. But I mean, I definitely see your point. I just guess for me, I view and th- keep, don't get wrong, I I love Guillermo del Toro. Mm-hmm. He's a fantastic director. He really is, and he, he definitely deserved to win. I just feel that you know, Get Out is more of a richer story. Than Shape of Water, for me, mm. it's more in the horror genre, so I automatically yeah. gravitate yeah, towards true. that. It's true. Um, but yeah, a good good batch of movies. I say just take out Phantom Thread and put Logan in. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, what the Logan. hell? Let's just, just redo What's this. Put fuck? Logan in I'm there. Su- I'm surprised <laughs> that Logan didn't get anything. Yeah, but you know it's the Academy. Fuck them. 
<laughs> um, yeah, I thought so. I thought there was a chance uh, just kind of going down. Let's just head down the list yep. here for the Oscars with director. I every once in a while they will flip uh, when it when it's a two way race between the director of one movie and then the Oscar will go to the other movie. You mean when Argo won, but they couldn't stomach giving Ben Affleck a best director Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, or when they gave Ang Lee best director for Brokeback Mountain and then Crash for some reason won. <laughs> hey, I own both films. I hope some people are like, you own Crash? Shut up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I thought they were really going to give the Oscar to Jordan Peele. Yeah. To, to, not just to make a message. I don't want it. He, I thought he also deserved it. And then I thought Shape of Water was going to win Best Picture. But, yeah. you know, it ended up going to Guillermo. 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 Um, and, you know, so he won for directing and, you know, it won for Best Picture. So, as usual, the old smug white liberal men who like to smell their own farts picked the movie that made them look really good. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then there were no surprises in the acting categories. Oh, no. I no. I picked everybody. You, you picked everybody, too, right, John? You got them all yep. right? Yep. Um, so, Best Supporting Actor went to Sam Rockwell. Alice and Janney got Best Supporting Actress for I, Tonya. Yeah, and Sam Rockwell, his speech was, like, quick. Yeah, but I mean, no, he didn't waste anything. I, I I think he knew he was winning, you know. Which is uh, weird because you'd think you'd have a long speech. If if there was any upset, I thought it might be Willem Dafoe for the Florida Project. Yeah, yeah, he, I, I would heard have loved he was to have seen him that, go up yeah. and be like, "Jokes on you, Spider Man!" <laughs> Just throw a <laughs> pumpkin bomb out. Yeah. The but um, my favorite part of the award season this year has been Sam Rockwell's partner Leslie Bibb, who I've known through other yeah. projects, and she's an actress in her own right. Um, she's been a lot of teen stuff, but she has been so amazing, like just like. Watching her be so proud of her spouse has been really cute. I I, I don't know. That's that's been good for me. I really liked her dress at the Oscars too. Uh, Lori Metcalf for Lady Bird though, like, oh, she really deserved. You know, it, I mean, it, when we talk about awards and we've talked about this, too. if you want to go into our archives, uh, Psychos Nation, you'll see how we really feel about award shows. Yeah, and they're kind of silly. Mm-hmm. To, but I thought that it was a much more like subtle, nuanced performance than Alice. So and real, I Tanya. Now, granted. Tanya Harding's mother was a crazy bitch. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> it was an interesting I mean, character. Yeah. You know? You're going to go over the top by nature because that human being. But you know is what? Top, like, but... like, I think a, a really good uh, supporting actress uh, has to almost, you know, help the, the main actor or actress in the mm-hmm, film. Mm-hmm. You know, and like with I, Tanya, you had Margot Robbie who did a fantastic job. She was very good in that. But I, I think that. Her role would not be nearly as strong without having that foil of Allison Janney. Mm. Yeah, and you know what I mean. And Allison Janney's just a fantastic human being in general. So you know, seeing her win was really great. You know, yeah. obviously, I mean, she's she's awesome. She's very eloquent, and you know, has you know really great thoughts like on the world and and on the the craft of of acting and everything. So it was nice to see her get it. Um. Yeah, actor in a leading role. I thought there was maybe a 1% chance that it might go to Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, um, well, he was a favorite. <laughs> like, he was the second choice favorite in a lot of these for what Call Me By Your Name, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah, and here, here's a big spoiler alert. If you haven't seen this movie and you plan to, uh, maybe just, you know, turn the volume off for about 10 seconds. Um, at the end of the movie, he, you know, doesn't get to be with, you know, his love. And mm-hmm. he looks into the fireplace, longingly wondering where his place is in the in the world. And it's about five to ten minutes and it's like clearly that whole oscar like for your consideration just him like you you Uh, just read the the extended long take you know and (laughs) but no cynicism aside he was very good in that movie but i mean you know when you pound gary oldman into that much fat rubber like you know (laughs) you know he's baiting for it a lot of times you know when i'm picking these and trying to predict things like you have to look at the politics behind the scenes you know because gary oldman's never won an award before and he has had a long and distinguished career even though he's a shitbag um you know um (laughs) that's how you really feel lame (laughs) the other actor no fuck him um the other actor um you know timothy he's a young man He's yeah. going to be nominated again, and and if not, then maybe this is his best performance, you know. But I'm sure but, Cuba Cooding Jr. thought he'd be nominated again. <laughs> yeah, but they don't. I mean, but they don't give it to you when you're young, you know. Yeah. Usually, I mean, a, another good example of this is uh, one of the writing credits. Uh, speaking of Call Me by Your Name, James Ivory won for Best Adapted Screenplay. Yeah. That was as much of a nod to his very long career as it was to anything else. You know, he's an older man. That was that was a. It, it, that was easy to pick because you know the situation at hand. Like when Paul Newman won for The Color of Money. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's the same thing with cinematography. I mean, like I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned this to you. I thought that 
Roger Deakins was going to get it because he's basically the, the master of cinematography uh, dating mm-hmm. back all the way to the 80s and 90s. Oh, so yeah, absolutely. It was, it was really, and he's never won one. He's always been nominated, but he's never won one. Again, so it was almost... It's a nod to the career. Got to give it to him. Yep. So, which sucks because, I mean, you know, Rachel Morrison was the nominated for... The first woman for, ever to for be Mudbound. nominated. But I think, I told you, I said, it's going to go to Roger Deakins. Yeah, and, and, you know, I picked Rachel Morrison out of, you know, solidarity, but it was actually, it was really sad to me when she lost. I actually didn't yeah. realize it was going to affect me so much, but I was really sad. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just one big game of politics. That's all it is. Like the films that win awards, like the people in the films, are the ones that politic the most for it. It's not mm-hmm. what is necessarily the best film. It's who plays the game, the, the campaign, most. who markets it. Because yeah. that's the thing a lot of people don't understand is that you know it isn't just hey, let's submit our movie in and wait to hear hear back. Right. It's, let's submit our movie and then let's barrage them with all of our ad crap <laughs> for, for the next couple months. You know, right. Uh, let's move on to everybody's favorite scary grandmother, Frances <laughs> McDormand. You know, it's so easy to just favorite paint her as crazy. But I think a lot of what she said was so important. You know, like everybody who watched the Oscars went and Googled what an inclusion rider is. And that's exactly what she meant for people to do. Lane, what is an inclusion rider? An inclusion rider is um, a clause in an actor's contract that says they won't work on the film unless there's a certain percentage of... Um, diversity in the cast and crew Mm -hmm. so that means both race and gender so you have to have a certain percent of um, you know non-white non-male you know or else a a star won't do it so this would be particularly effective for the biggest best paid stars to insist on this inclusion writer because they have the most power and the studios are most likely to do what they want so that's why it's important I will say, in theory, an inclusion rider is a great idea, but that's coming from the luxury of being two-time Academy Award winner Frances McDormand, who probably has enough money and to retire forever, probably doesn't care if she does another role, is already famous out the ass. Like, imagine, oh, I'm not going to take this movie as you know, my first big break because there's not enough diversity on the thing. Nobody's going to step away from a project if it's their first big break but like i just said that's not who she's talking to she's She's talking talking to the the biggest stars with the most Mm -hmm. influence but to help them lift everybody else up but their union everybody's got to play by the same rules well everybody's union but you can still have an inclusion rider in your contract and be union right okay um she's not asking like mr joe nobody to put that in his contract when he's just starting in the business on his first film you know she's asking you know people that are really famous and really established to do so, like people who have won Oscars. I think the bigger problem is, have we? why do we get to the point in this industry where you have to do inclusion writers? That's the bigger question to ask. I mean, I is think How did it's... it get this bad where it's, oh, now we have to make sure on a contract basis that it includes this? Well, at least, I mean, think about the fact that an inclusion writer exists. I mean, if you think about old black and white movies that our moms still like but make us want to die, I mean, there's actors actually in blackface. <laughs> yeah, like, it's pretty terrible. Do you know what I mean? Like, we, I think we've come a Looking long way. Looking at you, way. Mickey Rooney. You know, a lot of the, um, a lot of older movies are exclusively white. You yeah. know, and, and that's that's not what life is like. And I think that that's wrong, you know, but um, at least we have this sort of thing, you know, that is being brought about in awareness. At least the the clause is something that already exists. You know, at least we're now we all know what it is, you know, which is great, mm-hmm. you know, so because people who might not follow much about the movie biz might not know. So, well, I think it's important for the crew end of it, especially because, you know, we often don't know what goes on behind the scenes. With these movies, I mean, hell, we just talked a couple weeks ago about how Uma Thurman almost died crashing a car, Yep, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, and that only came out multiple years later. So, you know, the crew is really where, you know, it's important to make sure you have people of color, you have women um, and representation there because you don't really know who's working on your movies. You know, you can see who's on the screen, but you don't know who's really behind. So I think, yeah, making sure that it includes the crew in there is, you know, it's just as important. And, you know, I, I teased her a second ago, but. It's. I think people are weirded out by Frances McDormand because she doesn't give any fucks. No, she's and she's so intense yeah. and and she's too, just gone. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's great. Well, especially too, you know, to see it like as another woman. Like obviously, she wore a gown because that's what you're supposed to do. But she had very minimal makeup and hair dressing like mm-hmm. for it. And you know, as much as you know, we we look up to someone maybe like Meryl Streep. Like she plays by. I mean, she plays the game. Like she is in full makeup, full hair. You know, she she wears her glasses, but still. And I mean, I, mean, I got to be know, honest with you. 
that's why she's got like what ten Oscars. She plays the game. Two, two. She's Meryl a million. doesn't have. Two. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you, uh, you were talking about Meryl. Meryl yeah, yeah Meryl's got like ten. She has three. She has twenty like seven nominations. Okay, but <laughs> yeah. Point is, is she plays the game. She plays the game, and, and Frances McDormand does not. Yeah. And she looks absolutely crazy, kind of like she looks like your aunt that like got into the wine, like she had too much riesling <laughs> at dinner, and she's just like ranting about shit, but like in a good way, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. one thing that I would want to say, like I know we don't talk about the um the pre show on this show that much, but as I've said, it's my Super Bowl, and I like watching the coverage ahead of time. You know, we talked about um. You know, Ryan Seacrest and and I noticed he talked to a lot of men that night. I noticed that there were a few people who were like nominated that he talked to that probably had to speak with everyone on the press. I thought that was all interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted to shout it out to uh, Kristen Dos Santos, who is one of the um, uh, E network uh, correspondence right now yeah. and she did the show like back with Juliana um, they were like at some mansion or something I don't know they were somewhere like that was not the red carpet and they kept going back and forth like to Ryan and them um, Kristen Dos Santos like totally knew her research she knew the stats for women in the industry and women in the industry are at 4% right now as wow. far as like the crew is concerned, that's why I'm bringing this up. Four, but this, four. yeah, but four percent. But this, Jesus um, Christ. but it was cool because they talked about Rachel Morrison being nominated for cinematography, and Kristen was saying like, you know, we see that, we see like, you know, obviously, um, uh, the director of Wrinkle and Time, um, Ava DuVernay, um, the the idea that you know women and, and girls who are young are seeing this as a valid career choice you know um it is so so important and it was cool because even though it was kind of uncomfortable and like she was in like a sparkly gown and she's talking to Julianne Rancic you know like she's saying like we need to do better we need more inclusivity we need more of this you know and everything I, I thought that was awesome like she was like the only part of E that was even watchable that night well you know I at my happiest times working wherever it has been is ones where there's been at least an even amount of women or not more women. So I would hate to be on a big Hollywood set, just have that giant sausage fest. You know, like, <laughs> so much fuck, We need some more women around. Yeah. The, you know, the more I've been on indie sets yeah. that were moderate size that were all sausage fests. Yeah. Wow. It's, like maybe you get one or two women who are on it and just like, well, I mean, when you're a woman and you're even just trying to hook up a, a DVD player and yeah. guys like my penis is threatened and just go over and be like, let me just belittle you while you work on that, because I'm challenged by you touching electronically. Like, yeah. Why would they ever pick up a camera? Right. Yeah. I mean, well, right. too, when I was an undergraduate, even purchasing my first camera for school, you know, I wanted oh, my God. own my own equipment. The guy sold it to me wrong. He told me it did a bunch of shit that it didn't because he didn't think I knew any better, you know? And when it didn't do any of the things that I asked him because I had done my research and I knew exactly what I wanted and when it didn't do any of those things, I tried to return it and the store wouldn't take it back without a restocking fee until I, like, threw a holy fit. Like, I fucking lost that my mind. That particular because... electronics store that I think you're talking about... It was Circuit City. Okay. Okay. Well, I was going to say one that's still in business. No, it was um, Circuit City. But, I mean, I've I've encountered that with just people being dumb about electronics but to like the attitude was that i didn't know what i was talking about right. and he was going to tell me what i wanted right you know so i mean like that's something that i see in every corner of the you know the industry yeah. you know i mean like well, it's not it's, just that too. it's like comic book shops and, yep you know, oh i won't sports i won't go to yeah. i won't go to edie's i think yeah. i've said that on the oh, show Ides? before or Ides, is that how you say it? Oh my god! I won't go there. I yeah. won't go there. They they look at you like you're a fucking like I've been bimbo. In there. And well, I, I've been there just myself, and they look at you like you're you're just an idiot. Yeah, like no, it's literally. It's not even undressing you with their yeah. eyes. They're like Princess Leia slave costuming you with your eye with their eyes. Like yeah. it's so fucking ridiculous. From a from a Fuck guy that. who grew up reading multiple different comic books and still does read comic books, those guys that work there have never sniffed a pussy. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> wow. they, so vibrant. Wow. They're painting you so They're very threatened by women. Like, no, you can't like what I like because you won't fuck me. Goodness you know? gracious. <laughs> by the way, I, I want to start a campaign, by the way, fuck a sociopath. Because you ever notice all these guys <laughs> that go on murder sprees just never get fucked? And that's part of the reason they go, I'm so full of jizz and no one wants to fuck me. <laughs> just shoot up schools like... And post offices and, and <laughs> hotel buildings. Like, Fuck a sociopath. Yeah. Just do the thing, you know, help out. Because maybe if they just squirt once, they won't shoot up a place. John, that's literally how women get murdered. Because the sociopath, like, oh. can't control their rage and kills, like, women. No, you bring a bodyguard. And he stands in the corner and watches this disturbing. So it's, it's, 
you're talking about <laughs> prostitutes. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, and those get murdered all the time. They get murdered all the time. This is not- okay. So what we do is we legalize prostitution. <laughs> oh. We get them bodyguards. They bang sociopaths. I literally just read Mind Hunter. Everything you're saying is so wrong. So <laughs> you, wrong. Y'all thought you were just getting an Oscar one here. You didn't think you were getting, you know. Psychology 101 Psychology with 101. Dr. Willis Cross. John Willis Cross views do not reflect the rest of Cinema Psycho Show and their affiliates. <laughs> For all you those triggered, I'm just kidding. Um, you are the worst. Let's move on. We'll move um, on. So original screenplay, um, Jordan Peele. Got yeah, his Oscar. dude, yep. I like, I like cheered like it was a soccer match. I was so stoked when he uh, won. He what are you looked, European? Yeah, dude. <laughs> I, I cheered for the soccer match. Whatever. I mean, I, the soccer matches are very heated and exciting, and I hate football. So, mm-hmm. but um, no, um, he looked shocked, didn't he? He, I thought he looked he was just stunned. Like, what the fuck? He was. Not I can't believe he was shocked. It. I mean. Everybody expected, I think, except Jordan. I think so too, yeah. and that was so cool. Did you guys see like the um the cut like the posts afterwards of Michael Keegan Key losing his shit yeah. when um Jordan won? Like that's who you want on he's, your team, man. I have goosebumps just talking about it. Like the back of my hair went up. Oh my he's god, got, he's got to be pissed to a degree. And for all of um the wrestling fans out there listening to our show, he's the Genetti. Now <laughs> he's the Genetti now, Aww. and if you get that Aww. reference, I love you. <laughs> if you get that reference, tweeted him at the unreal real J Wolves. Yeah, the unreal um, J Wolves. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, like he looked, he looked shocked. You know, um, uh, Keegan Michael Key looked so excited, and I thought that was really great. Um, the whole situation was cool. His um, you know, Jordan's speech was short, but I thought very heartfelt. Um, but I mean, he really deserved it. It was brilliantly written. Um, I think that was the strongest part of the movie was the writing. So I think that there was a slim chance he could go to the big sick. Oh, that yeah, would have been, I think, was, the only. Yeah, I, I could have seen there. that for sure. Yeah, no, because the writing there was very good as well. But well, um, I didn't adapt a screenplay. Go to Logan. I know. Well, <laughs> it should have been best actor, best director. Best, best <laughs> like we screenplay. said, though, um, you know, James Ivory has had a really long career, and that was a large part of you know why he got it. I think so. Are you guys at all disturbed by how Pixar basically has a monopoly on animated films? Yes, they do, and, yeah, it, they and do. it is upsetting. But Coco was really fucking I don't care. good. I don't it care. was really good. <laughs> Look at him. I don't care. That's okay. You don't have Calm to. Calm down, Brian. You don't have to. No, I, I just. It's like fucking. I, Pixar is still part of Disney, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Disney so, Pixar. So it's like Disney's got Marvel. Disney's got, you know, Star Wars. They've got fucking Oscar winning animated films. Let other people win, for God's sake. Like, Jesus Christ, you know? Well, I mean, yeah. A movie, like, there's never going to. Apparently, there's never going to be an art film that wins an animated feature. Like, Loving Vincent, beautiful. A beautiful yeah. film, but it's not going to win because it's not Pixar. It's not, yeah. you know. Um, but you ever notice that there's always the off brand is the extreme one that like wants to like seem edgy. Like mm-hmm. there's Coke, but then there's Pepsi. And Pepsi's extreme. Sega was extreme. And then there's DreamWorks, which we're not Pixar. We're extreme. No, DreamWorks we have isn't. Fart jokes, you know. Yeah, DreamWorks. Is terrible. <laughs> DreamWorks is terrible. Yeah, no, DreamWorks well, is real like bad. It's coming out and stuff. Oh, so like, yeah. We're not Pixar. Back then. Our character farts. <laughs> That's true. Like, like I'll be honest with you. I mean, when I saw the Boss Baby one. Oh, my God. If Boss Baby like, one, I would have shit. What the fuck? <laughs> it's like, seriously, come on. <laughs> Boss Baby? Well, I'm excited for whatever um, Pixar movie wins next year. Yeah, me too. I'm going to actually fill in my ballot for next year. Everything's going to be blank. Cars except 5. I'm going to put checkmark <laughs> Pixar for animated feature. Got so that be, one in the no, back. No, I guarantee you the Oscar voters are just like, oh, that one there, that Coco. Was that a Pixar movie? Oh, I okay. went. I, okay, I went golfing with the head of Pixar yesterday. Yeah. So I'm going to just go give him. The, hey, did the you see any of the films? No, me neither. No, <laughs> just Pixar did mean, it right. It's good. It's rare for Pixar not to win. And I, I do think that that needs to change soon. But at least it was for this movie, Coco, that was very good. You know, was very much, um, you know, kind of in the celebration of diversity. Mm-hmm. A little bit more so than other movies in the past, but there are certain tried and true things that you just like keep in mind when you kind of pick your picks. I mean, spoiler alert, like this is like one of my big things, but you usually go with the Pixar movie for animated, you know, especially this year when all the other movies, except for the indie um, Loving Vincent, Painting Vincent, Loving Vincent, Loving. Breadwinner was was also a indie film, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you ignore the indies and you pick like one of the bigger ones and you know obviously Coco was a was a no brainer but another one too um for sound editing and sound mixing if you don't know just pick the war movie that's usually what wins yeah, yeah. or the sci-fi film well 
Speaking of which, I think for time and because our audience doesn't care, let's move past foreign language film, documentary feature, documentary short and short subject film. Um, yeah, well, I was mad. Usually this is where I shine and like a couple things like, you know, I thought DeKalb Elementary for sure was going to be a shoe in. It's about elementary school and, and, and guns like mm-hmm. that's super pertinent to to the times now. I mean, I don't begrudge any of the films that did win because, I mean, it's so great watching these people who aren't like toiled by the industry like to win these things and be so excited. Um, I thought Dear Basketball winning was bullshit because of Kobe Bryant. Oh, yes. Um, we talk about how the rape. I mean, I know we did earlier, but he's a rapist. <laughs> yeah. and He won a documentary. And what, yeah. did, what did he do? He just stood around and been like, yeah, oh, that all sounds good. And dribbled he, a ball. Like, he wrote it. Oh, yeah. He wrote it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, apparently, I don't know. Um, and the I, Rock wrote his autobiography. Yeah, in I was going to say, you know, you know, Ben Affleck says he's a writer. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, sure, Cope, Copes is a is a writer now. I was very surprised by Best Documentary Short. I thought Heroin was going to really win um, about women in the opioid crisis, and it was um, that surprised me because it was Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the four hundred five, but. Mm. Um, those are usually where I shine. Did not shine this year. But um, sound editing and sound mixing both went to Dunkirk, dude. And I picked them both because I'm a fucking genius. Well, I'd, Baby Driver, if it was, if there's any merit to that movie, it is the sound um, mixing. It's weird that it was nominated. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm apparently the only one that thought that movie was average at best uh, last year. But um, I'm, I can't believe that didn't walk away with at least sound editing or sound mixing. Yeah. Um, but once again, I'm sure you know, it's rare Christopher for the, Nolan knows how to play the game. I mean, it is rare for the same movie to win twice, you yeah. know, for, for both categories. That's rare. Yeah, Lane, you had mentioned Phantom Thread for costume design, cinematography. I really do think that Deacons did deserve it for Blade Runner 2000. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's almost cheating because, of course, that movie by its nature is gorgeous shot. Oh, well, gorgeous well shot, gorgeous it was, shot, I, I knew that it was going to win uh, cinematography and visual effects. I already knew that. I was like, there's there's no way. That Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, Kong Skull Island, Star Wars, or War for the Planet of the Apes was going to take them. Yeah, they, they really. I thought that Star Wars had a chance, but uh, but no. um, it, it didn't have a chance mainly because it, it was stuff we've already seen. Yeah, before. there was nothing new. There was nothing really new. You combine visual the visual effects they did for Blade Runner twenty forty nine and the cinematography of Roger Deakins. It just, yeah. it was beautiful. Maybe you needed to see it on the big screen, though, because John rented it. And I don't know, I just wasn't super impressed. I mean, I was also working when I was yeah. watching it, so maybe that's why. But So, Lane, how did you how did you feel about Jim Kimmel hosting? He was okay. Um, like I said, you know, if anything, I thought the broadcast this year was kind of bland, um, which is usually, like, kind of where the Oscars operates the best, because either it's, like, great or, like, a total fail, right? So, like, you, you probably want bland over a total fail. Yeah. Um, the I think the best thing a host can do is be in the show very little and let things go to the presenters, let things go to, you know, packages of, um, you know, like the, the video bump- bumpers and stuff that they do. Um, you know, I think that that's usually where it's the best idea. Um, they did the same shenanigans as last year, though. They went like across the street to another movie theater and like handed out snacks like for that reason. He probably won't be back next year because they'll probably just want something new. Like that's you can't ask Jimmy Kimmel not to do like his bit. Did they you know have what I mean? Fallon like, one year or two? No, no, I don't not think, yet. Not yet. No, they may. No. They may ask him. But yeah, I don't. I'm supposed to ask. Oh my god! <laughs> just doing the um, just doing the same bit over just kind of made me mad because it's like you're you're wasting time with that bullshit. But yet the guy who's like busted his ass and he won best documentary short has to thank like two people and then be done like because there's not enough <laughs> yeah. time. Like yeah. I'm sorry, like Gal Gadot does not need to. Or Gal Gadot does not need to hand out like a fucking hoagie to somebody across hey. the street. Like I don't give a shit. Like let let the documentarian talk. You hey, know that's gonna be the only time Gal Gadot is at the Oscars. Let her soak <laughs> it in, man. <laughs> See, I mean, I thought all the presenters did a really good job. Usually, there's some kind of gaffe, and like I know there was like a thing about Jennifer Garner, but I thought everybody did a good job. You know, that's what I'm saying. It was kind of a like I I as I said, I didn't watch the awards because I just don't. Um, but like any of the news about it, none of it was really like crazy. No, no. Like, well, especially after last like year when the yeah. wrong fucking film was called for best picture. I mean, that was a huge deal, that was but awesome. Like I said, they, I thought <laughs> they handled awesome. that as well as you could. Um, you know, it was, it was fine. So, I mean, it was, it was an okay broadcast. It was yeah. nothing special. What the show is, does follow a lot of similar beats year by year. It does. It's more what I find the show is just is fascinating as a reflection of, where the year was in movies, but really more importantly, where the movies were in terms of where we're at historically. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. You know, and you had a lot of movies about women, 
that were not about them just in the background or talking yeah. about men. And we even saw sex. a little bit of that starting yeah. last year, you yeah. know, with like hidden figures and yep. stuff. You had a lot of stories about people that were, um, you know, considered, you know, minorities in marginalized, country, or marginalized in some sure. degree or fashion. Um, and I think that the movies were really represent, you know, representations of where we're at with society yeah. and the movies that were nominated for that reason, you know, three billboards, lady bird, the post, um, get out. Well, I'm just in movies that are about, you know, women, Oh, women, I you see. know, and, uh, <laughs> get out. It's not exactly the most feminine, uh, <laughs> it's not, positive it's, movie. That's, that's not what the story is though. And that's, yeah, okay. Right. that's um, okay. But you know, and just movies about, you know, black men movies about, mm-hmm. you know, um, homosexual character so it's yeah. it's very reflective and very refreshing to see you know if you go back even 10 years or 20 years and oh just go back and see what those movies are about and who they're manned by and who's in them oh you know. yeah the diversity is huge yeah let me ask you guys a question as we're getting kind of towards the end of this yeah if you could run the oscars what would you do to uh change it I would have more musical numbers, like live ones, because yeah. I think that's always so fun. That's like old Hollywood, and it's if the, the and if the songs are funny, like I think that that's really neat. That was yeah. the best part I thought of when Seth MacFarlane hosted the Oscars because yeah. he did big numbers. Like I think like you want like as good of a stage show, like that old Hollywood kind of like glamour, but make it funny, make it irreverent, you know, make it a little mm-hmm. ironic. Like I think that that would be really cool. You, John, I, what do you think? I wouldn't change anything because I don't think this show is supposed to be anything unique or fresh every year i think it's supposed to be exactly what it's supposed to be you know and in fairness this these awards were created in the first place to kind of crush unions they didn't succeed but they just wanted to develop sideways in order for um groups to create to destroy unions and they also realized they probably should have awards that go in with that god you're so bleak but that's why the Oscars come from, you know <laughs> i mean but the i mean that's what the sag awards sure but i think i've got yeah. one to beat all of you um in terms of what i would change um i would ban any movie from competing that has a budget of under a million that that has a budget of over a million dollars i mean you can't make a Mm, movie you can't can't i'm I'm just saying any any movie in 1977 star wars almost won best picture and yeah. Jaws almost won Best Picture in 1975. Do you know why I'm saying that? Okay. Go okay. Go. The reason why I'm saying that is these movies are, are big business, and that's my problem. They're, they're not necessarily giving us the best films. They're the best films that a small group of people, about 3,000 people, have picked. And it's not even picked in a, a, a great way. It's actually, I was, I was reading uh, an article, and they, they talked about how they actually pick the best picture, and it's not done by whoever has the most votes. It's actually done in some weird sort of uh, way. But I just feel that the, these movies are, are every year they come out, and it's like, oh, well, that's going to be the Oscar film or this sort of thing. That doesn't really help the industry I at mean, all. five or six of these films had very large budgets. And some yeah. of them, I mean, even the that's indie what I'm ones. Saying. Yeah. I mean, Lady Bird cost $10 million to make. That's still a but low budget film I now. guess. I guess my thinking about this is, are we just celebrating the celebrity or are yeah. we celebrating the industry? No, I mean, it's it's well, just a big pageantry circle jerk. Yeah, and that's that, I'm just saying I don't like that. I'm saying that yeah. I think that if you wanted to make the awards truly about the artistry of film, then you have to take it away and divorce it from the celebrity of film. Well, I mean, I do think that sometimes artistry is, you know, um, is awarded, you know, like The Shape of Water absolutely deserve best product um, production design. You know, like there's, yeah. there's art in that, you know, but for that sort of art, you need money. Well, I don't think that this show should dumb itself down for ratings or popularity. I'm not like saying people, dumbing it down. I'm saying quite literally well, strip out anything that's a that's a big budget film. Well, a lot of people have said that like, oh, you know, in the movies I liked wasn't nominated. Why wasn't Wonder Woman nominated? Or when, you know, remember when Dark Knight and Wally didn't get nominations? Yeah. You know, they shouldn't just and I'm not saying anything about any of those three films I mentioned, but it shouldn't be just movies that you really like. No. And that's you that, know, there are awards. Award ceremonies for those. I mean, right. you have like the People's yeah. Choice Awards no. for that sort of thing. Yeah, People's um, <laughs> Choice Awards. But what I, all I'm saying is, I think it it is too much about the celebrity. It is too much about what is this person wearing? What is this new thing we're going to talk about this year? Because every year there's always something. The, I remember being a kid and it was all about AIDS 
That's what everyone talked about the one year was just fucking AIDS. And it's like, <laughs> there's nothing. Everyone has AIDS. <laughs> no, but do you remember AIDS that? I, I remember seeing the Oscars and going like, everyone's talking about AIDS or everyone's talking about South Africa. And it just seems to me like this is so further away from the artistry of filmmaking. And I would love to see it one year. Just try it. Where maybe, just maybe, we focus on the artistry of film and not the celebrity. That is my. That is the only thing I would change. That's a big problem. I know. That's that's that's, that's all. So it, entwined. It sounds like you're kind of saying shut up and dribble. Le, yeah. The LeBron quote, like that he's just. Uh, took oh a political yeah, stance, yeah. Don't and they say told anything. Him to shut up and dribble. No, I'm not yeah. saying that. I have yeah. nothing against you know bringing up issues. It just seems to me like they bring it up, but at the same time, you got Gary Oldman, who you're saying. Is a, a rapist? No, oh no, he oh, he's not a rapist. Wife. He, beat, he his beat his wife. wife in like okay, 04. so you've got things like that, but they're also the same people talking about oh the Time Is Up movement, the Me Too movement. Yeah, it's yeah. just completely counter. And that's like Mr. Man Show. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's ethics, my favorite yeah. thing. That is my absolute favorite thing. Is Mr. Man Show is talking about you know women's issues. Well, he is the wrong fucking person to be I talking mean, about. I mean, in that, that case, though, I mean. <sighs> And, Mr. And I would, Girls on Trampoline. Well, and I okay? would want to do my research, but I don't remember reading or seeing or knowing anything about, you know, Jimmy Kimmel having acted inappropriately with anyone. And I'm the first person to say the man show was gross, but it was also a product of its time. And are you guys saying that men aren't allowed to change and evolve and grow up? I mean, like, Christ, was he in his 20s when he did that show? He's a man now. He's like a, a full human dad. Like, you know, are people in real life not allowed to also have a character arc? And like I said, you know, I would need to look into it. I, I don't think Jimmy Kimmel's a shitbag, but I think he should go no, to James I now. No, I, I, don't, I don't think he is either. I just but, think you know, he's like, the wrong person. It was, I mean, it, what he did know? in the show was gross. But like I said, he personally, to my knowledge, hasn't done anything, right. you know, even remotely on the level of like a Harvey Weinstein. You know what I'm I mean? I'm not trying to get too far away. I'm just trying to say that I, I think Hollywood the, is full of hypocrites, it, 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 you know? It's that, and I just think the celebrity is just too much. I don't see these, these award ceremonies as really anything more than let's just circle jerk each other. Like, that's all it is. A it's not it, about yes. the artistry anymore. A lot of it, yes, well, but I do think that there are artists that were, you know, awarded because, like, Jordan Peele deserved that fucking Oscar and yeah, he got it. You he know? did. Sometimes well, it works. First off, man, everybody's getting AIDS and shit. Sorry, you mentioned AIDS <laughs> as the showgirls <laughs> reference here. Um, <laughs> will somebody please remix Brian and his rant about AIDS? Oh, my God, that would be amazing. Dubstep music. <laughs> that would be incredible. We would love you but forever. Everyone's getting, getting of... AIDS. Everyone's getting AIDS. But a lot of these movies would... I would have never heard of Call Me By Your Name if it hadn't right. gotten nominated. And it probably would have never come anywhere near me if it hadn't gotten nominated. So there's something to be said for a lot of these movies getting a wider release and How to a wider get nominated, audience. Though. What's that? How to get nominated. Right. Well, the well, studio. That's, that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. But some of these movies but were nominated because how they would were I have good. Ever, how would I, you know, I mean... I like to think, oh, well, I, I'm in the industry, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, and I make films, and I have a podcast about filmmaking. But how would I, even in that situation, have heard of "Call Me by Your Name" or somebody that isn't, you know, as linked into, um, you know, movie news, you know, online as I am, uh, you know, or you know, Lady Bird? Like these movies would have been completely ignored and only been in three major cities if they hadn't been nominated for Best Picture. They they are allowed to have a wider audience that way. Yeah, okay. and like I said, you know, it's... They're, they're I'm just of, bringing up my issues. Yeah, they're <laughs> full of hypocrites, but too, I mean, just, just as a final point, you know, like... No movie can be made for less than a million these days. I mean, even Get Out was for... Their budget was $4.5 million. You can't make a movie for under a million dollars. $5 million. That's a cutoff. How about that? $5 million? It, it would have excluded Lady Bird. Lady Bird was 10 why are they spending that much money? On it? I mean, the <laughs> shit costs money. Like John said, there's unions. You got to pay people. How about 50 million, Brian? 50 million? It's not that much in today's it really isn't. Hollywood. All yeah, right, 50 million. <laughs> All right, we just fixed million. the Oscars, everybody. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's our show. Uh, if, let us know what you think about the Oscars. Yeah, you know? tweet at us. Tweet and if us. anybody wants to talk about the outfits, get at me. I can be found on Twitter at LA underscore crop. You could talk about to me about the office, but I won't really know what to say at the Unreal J. Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me at Brian Cottington. It was pretty. <laughs> also run the Psycho Show page. Be sure to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google Plus at Psycho Show. You can also find us on the Epic Ass Network at EpicAssNetwork.com. If you have a favorite movie or question you want to throw away, you can contact us at CinemaPsychoShow.com. 
Make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Send us a rate, send us a review. We love getting those. Also, be sure to subscribe to Psychos Nation, our monthly newsletter, and catch a new episode available every Sunday. News bit, Brian Connington just got nominated for Best Supporting Actor in Savini and Me, the Tom Savini love story. Fuck you. <laughs> that was awesome. Epicast. 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 Epicast.